Hello, it's Scott Manley here with another one of these Deep Space updates. In the next week, if everything goes according to plan, SpaceX will be launching their first real batch of Starlink satellites. Starlink is SpaceX's entry into the global communication network, and their plan is bigger and bolder than basically anything else out there. According to FCC filings, depending upon, well, they're, they're looking early on with hundreds of satellites, then thousands of satellites, and I think some of the applications call for like 12,000 satellites in low Earth orbit. And these will also communicate with something like up to a million ground stations, which just blows my mind. This is infrastructure on an, a stunning scale. Starlink is supposed to compete with other networks by providing much lower latency. Uh, on Earth, you know, you can send your signals via regular communication satellites, which are all in uh, you know, geostationary orbit. That is quite a long flight time for those photons. Or you can send across, say, transatlantic fibers. But, you know, when you fire a laser down a glass fiber, it's slower. It's about half the speed of a laser traveling through space. So in theory, if you send it up to a satellite and then it shoots the message across between its peers, it's traveling at the speed of light. So if the switching time is low enough, your packets could get there faster, which I guess for some applications will make a big difference, especially, say, if you're a Fortnite player. I don't know. More likely, people in financial markets will pay a little extra for this. And yeah, there's the prospect of being able to get good communications regardless of where you are on the Earth. So right now, we don't know exactly how many satellites are on the spacecraft. We don't really know what they look like. We did see a couple of satellites back on the PAS launch where uh, they were running as extra payloads. They were Tintin A and B, and they've been testing for a while. Um, but Gwyn has suggested that they, we expect two to six launches of Starlink satellites per year, and there's probably more sat, uh, Starlink launches later this year, in addition to the 18 to 21 SpaceX launches she expects uh, by the end of the year. So this is starting. This is, uh, wow, I'm really looking forward to see how this turns out, because of course, I might move house to the middle of nowhere and want really good internet connectivity. So I'm relying on you, Elon. <laughs> But, uh, but what was also interesting about this launch is that it's the first time that they are going to reuse a fairing. If you remember the Falcon Heavy that launched Arabsat, its fairing was recovered from the ocean. They didn't even bother to send out Mr. Steven this time. They just capped, picked it up out of the water and brought it back and presumably it's going to fly. And I'm, I'm sure they know what they're doing. They, this is also pretty much a demonstrator for their other customers to show that you know you can fly with a reusable fairing as well as you can fly with a reusable rocket. Now speaking of reusability, we should rewind to the CRS-17 launch. That was actually delayed a day because SpaceX were having issues where it might have prevented the recovery of the booster. And this is huge because NASA, if you remember, was kind of lukewarm to the concept of rocket reusability. But they actually allowed SpaceX to do this. And in fact, they said in a post-flight press conference that they were they had a vested interest in making this happen. And it's true, you know, despite all but despite being a customer that wants the best hardware, if they can make the costs lower, then that helps everyone. So this is a, this is very much a big step as far as I'm concerned. The CRS-17 launch, incidentally, was absolutely beautiful. The footage we got from it was great, especially when the boosters flipped around and were uh, firing the rocket engines at each other. The patterns that you could see in the sky there were, was great. And of course, the landing was clear all the way down to the barge, which normally doesn't happen, but because it was so close to shore, we had a consistent link all the way down. Of course, the reason it was so close to shore was that the landing zone was still out of commission. And there had been some speculation as to why, and Hans Konigsmann had said during the pre-flight briefing that was related to safing up the area. And some people took, the, took this to say, well, there's probably toxic chemicals, but then it was revealed that actually, no, there are a bunch of intact pressure vessels on site, and it either wasn't clear whether those had fuel or propellant or anything inside them. So last week, there was a couple of notifications about how SpaceX engineers were going to be safing any remaining hardware, and that there might be big orange clouds, which obviously indicates dinitrogen tetroxide. 
Now, we have saw those for a couple of days, that stopped, so I can presume at this point that whatever hardware is there is now safe. And there are people on site, you know, doing more work on this, perhaps getting a closer look. SpaceX has been working very hard trying to figure out what happened to their uh, Dragon test. Uh, a few more details came out that I hadn't initially heard. One is that the test stand they were working on was also a vibration simulator so that they were rocking the capsule around really hard and they were you know running these at higher margins than we'd expect during a normal launch you know like a factor of two that may have contributed. I've also heard that they have since been firing their Draco thrusters uh, and our super Draco thrusters and those have been fine. Uh, I've, I've heard that they don't think the pressure vessels are directly relevant so that leaves the plumbing and yeah, I guess we're going to find out a bit more, but yeah, right now it seems that it's an issue related to the integration of the various pieces of hardware with the capsule. And uh, yeah, that test is proceeding. Elsewhere, during some hearings about crew safety, uh, Re Representative Mo Brooks, who he was a guy that came in after Jeff Sessions left his post. So he's a Republican and he obviously is like taking his best, his chance to have you know, score some cheap points against SpaceX. Because um, he was bringing up, oh, I heard that you guys had a parachute failure test. And apparently SpaceX had a parachute test which didn't go quite according to plan. This was a test where they were going to intentionally, you know, cause one of their parachutes not to deploy correctly. And apparently the spacecraft landed a little harder than expected. Now, to be clear, this is a one of like 19 parachute tests they've done, including five where they were testing out parachute out capabilities. And this is what you expect during testing. They're working on it and they're iterating it. And yeah, if you've heard about SpaceX and parachute problems, this is straight up political theater from people that want to support their particular, you know, constituents or whatever. Uh, the guys in South Carolina, so I don't know what facilities are there. But, you know, regardless, I, I wouldn't worry about it too much. Uh, more interestingly, I guess, is over at Boca Chica. We haven't seen much since that initial little hop, but we have seen that they've continued working. I mean, first of all, they took the Raptor out and they stuck it in a truck and they've sent it off to a lab to be carefully disassembled and examined. Obviously, they don't want to do this in the middle of a field. They want to, you know, just make sure that firing at this close to the surface hasn't caused any interesting effects or damage or any change that need to happen. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing that Raptor firings are still continuing uh, up at their McGregor test facility, and they are ultimately moving to make Hopper fly to higher altitudes. And there's a few things they've started doing here. First of all, they've been laying a lot more concrete, which is kind of boring, and they've got new test rigs, but they've got, uh, they've added to Hopper a couple of RCS pods that have been taken off of Falcon rockets. And it's actually kind of, it's interesting to look because this seems very much like a hodgepodge. There are two different generations of RCS pods. These are powered by liquid nitrogen, or sorry, not by liquid nitrogen, but by pressurized nitrogen. So they're adding a bunch of extra nitrogen vessels to the top of the vehicle. They've been adding more of this, you know, high sheen plating to make it look shiny. Uh, yeah, and more piping, just there's more stuff being added to Hopper, even although it doesn't have the engine on it right now. And, you know, but a stone's throw away, they're also starting to stack the next Starship prototype, which is going to be a full-size prototype, a lot like this one, right? Oh, crap. Sorry, Ollie, I knocked your model down. Yeah, this is, this is what they're talking about compared to this is what Hopper was going to be, and then Hopper ended up being about that part, and then this is what I hear that they're going for. So for those that have asked, these models are by Ollie Braun, who makes SpaceX models. He also has, a, you know, assemble your own kits of Falcon 9s and Falcon Heavies and all that. And uh, yeah, great stuff if you want it. Uh, meanwhile, a couple of payloads from CRS-17 have been deployed on the space station now. Um, one is the Orbiting Carbon Observatory 3, which is taking the place of the old aerosols experiment that had failed. And then there is the X-ray communications experiment. And I like this one because these guys are very much in tune with my cultural leanings. The experiment is called XCOM. And can you guess what the badge looks like? That's right. So this experiment aims to demonstrate X-ray communications and it's just going to be doing it across the space station. 
On the space station already, there is an X-ray experiment called NICER. That's the Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer. And it is able to detect the arrival time of X-ray photons with extreme accuracy. So the, the XCOM experiment will send a modulated X-ray signal. And in theory, it should be picked up and they can demonstrate communications. Now, why would you want to communicate with X-rays? Well, there's a bunch of people kind of you know, saying maybe this could work. I mean, the first thing is that X-rays could in theory be focused to a tighter beam because their wavelength is shorter. X-rays might also be used to communicate to things that are traveling at hypersonic speeds when they have a plasma sheath around them. Essentially, they're traveling so fast the air is breaking down and they are in a blackout region. This happens to spacecraft during re-entry. So if you have, if you look at some of these experimental weapon systems that they've talked about, they will be traveling through the atmosphere, they will be leaving a trail of ionized gas and they cannot communicate with the outside world. Well, X-rays might be able to penetrate this. We're not sure. There's a lot of different ideas about this, but as it stands, I just thought this uh, deserved a mention because of its badge. Elsewhere in the world, I have to congratulate the Momo team, the interstellar technologies team in Japan that finally launched their sounding rocket to space. And they've had two very dramatic failures in the past, but this time their Momo rocket, which is about 10 meters tall and carries a 20 kilogram payload, it made it to 113 kilometers, which is fantastic. And of course, they're going to continue working on this. Their whole thing is making access to space cheaper, which is cool. They are going to build a bigger rocket in some point called the Zero, which will have 100 kilograms of payload. But I, I think it's cool because these guys were all crowdfunded and, uh, you know, working on a very, very small budget. So it's always great to see these small scale operations continue. Elsewhere, Rocket Lab is very much proving that it is not a small scale operation. It is launched like few more satellites in recent months. It launched the R3-D2 spacecraft for DARPA and it just launched the STP mission for the US Air Force, which is another technology proving experiment uh, mission where they have like three satellites on board. So Rocket Lab is very much showing that if you are trying to get into the small sat launch market with a small launcher, they are eating everyone's lunch right now. And there's a lot of other competitors, but Rocket Lab clearly have built, it, built up the technology and the launch cadence to dominate this sector at this point. They've also announced a satellite bus called the Photon, which uh, will include like their Curie engine, it'll include communications, attitude control, avionics, power. So you just bolt your electronics onto it. So, you know, Electron or Sp Rocket Lab they're really doing some great things at this point, and uh, it, it's good to see them moving forward. So yeah, I think that's most of the Space Launch Roundup. Obviously, we'll be watching Starlink launch next week. Oh, and they have just released or just opened up applications for press to watch the Falcon Heavy STP launch in June. So that'll be cool. I don't think I can get to it, but it'll be another Falcon Heavy launch for everyone to like jam up all the roads. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>